Diese Konferenz wird nun aufgezeichnet. Distinguished speakers from Germany and India, members and friends from the industry. A very good afternoon and good morning. Welcome to the web seminar on conformity assessment for a safe and competitive market being organized by the German Engineering Federation VDMA. We hope all of you and your families and employees are all safe and doing well. I welcome our speakers of the day, Mr. Wegner, Mr. Grinstead, Mr. Jani, and Mr. Sharma. My colleague, Mr. Sengupta, and I, Ajmal Fawad, will take you through the session today. Friends, conformity assessment involves a set of processes that show how a product, service, or system meets the requirement of a standard undergoing the conformity assessment process has a number of benefits. One, it provides consumers and other stakeholders with added confidence. Two, it gives the company a competitive edge. Three, it helps the regulators ensure that health, safety, or environmental conditions are met. Conformity assessment in India has developed in a structured manner over the past 20 years, following the setting up of the national accreditation boards, having MLA and MRA partnerships with the international forums, while product certification and quality management system certification continue to be the two most popular streams of conformity assessment. Others such as laboratory accreditation and third party inspections have been very significant growth catering to wide and diverse segments of industrial activity. Self-declaration is the latest stream that is being promoted by public as well as the private sector. In a recent move in India, the Department of, of Heavy Industries is planning to soon come out with the omnibus technical regulations for safety of machinery in India, making it mandatory for both imported and indigenous items to obtain certification from the Bureau of Indian Standards, BIS, uh, next slide, please. Uh, before we continue, I would like to request all the participants to kindly select Buke's active cameras for the options for optimal viewing experience. Please do turn off or keep mute your uh, microphones, keep it always red, and also post your questions to the chat box above. Next slide, please. Friends, the German Engineering Federation VDMA is an association of the German machinery and plant manufacturers with more than 3,250 members and over 1 million employees. It is the largest industrial association not only in Germany, but in whole of Europe. We cater to 38 specialized sectors under mechanical engineering. Our, our members produce uh, machinery worth Euro 232 billion and export 78% of it. Having a head office in Frankfurt, we are also present in Brazil, Russia, India, China, Belgium, and Japan. As uh, Next slide, please. As representatives of the German capital goods industry, we organize over 1,500 events per year and see more than 45,000 visitors every year. And this becomes possible only with the tireless efforts of more than 600 dedicated employees. Next slide, please. In India, the office is headed by Mr. Rajesh Nath, supported by Ms. Jamie Lee John in the West, Mr. Sandeep Roy in the East, Mr. Manohar in South, and Mr. Sengupta in the North. Next slide, please. Friends, through this webinar, we would like to throw light on the importance of conformity assessment for an organization, for the suppliers, consumers, and regulators. Its significance uh, for products to meet relevant design and safety standards, which in turn gives consumers confidence while buying machines. We will highlight how technical regulations work in India, the role of BIS in having the conformity assessment and various certifications. We will also inform you about the Indo-German cooperation uh, on conformity assessment and accreditation. And also we will get to know about the single market and self-certification in the European Union and various automation solutions for safe uh, machines. I now, uh, request my colleague, Mr. Rai, uh, Mr. Rijoy Singh Gupta, to take you through the program of the session, introduce the speakers, and uh, take the session forward. Over to you, Rijoy. Thank you.
thank you all for the discussion for to all uh, the distinguished panelists for today's session we we'll start off with mr philip brinton philip has gis for 5 years he uh, has been half years in new delhi he currently he is based in bangalore he experience is currently in bangalore having experience in uh, working german parliament consulate general in shanghai the area of expertise uh, is international regulatory cooperation as well as international trade and digital technologies the topic on which we will light is strengthening trust and easing business in the german cooperation on conformity assessment and accreditation over to you philip thank you very much rejoy for the kind introduction i hope i'm audible um, as you said, I'm going to present um, on strengthening trust and easing business through the Indo-German Corporation on Conformity Assessment and Accreditation. Just very briefly, I work for GIZ, which is the German Agency for International Cooperation, and we support the German government in implementing international cooperation projects around the world. Next slide. So the topic um, of my presentation, I think, is best understood with this graph, um, why the cooperation on conformity assessment is so relevant. Um, there has been a growing number of mandatory standards in India. Um, so here in the graph below, you can see the number of products which fall under mandatory certification by the Bureau of Indian Standards, which is India's standards body, but also um, a certification body. Um, and you can see that more and more uh, products um, are now regulated through mandatory standards. Especially in 2020, 2020, you see a sharp increase in the number of products regulated. Um, so we have the data now up until June 2020, but there has been um, actually additional ones since then. Um, especially um, products regulated this year has been uh, steel, electronic and IT devices, cables, toys, um, several electrical appliances, um, but also chemicals and glass. Next slide. And so now the question is, why do we care about these mandatory standards? Um, so far, India has had actually a, um, comparatively few mandatory standards, um, and that's why they're like um, trying to increase the number in, um, in order to um, protect protect consumers um, and in um, um, strengthen product safety overall. Um, but we worry about that um, these standards could turn into technical regulations. Um, according to the World Trade Organization, technical regulations are any documents which lay down product characteristics like standards um, for processes, production methods, but also the applicable administrative provisions uh, with which compliance is mandatory, for example, mandatory certification requirements. May also include uh, the terminology, symbols, packaging requirements, uh, and so forth. Next slide. And we asked, together with the Indo German Chamber of Commerce um, in 2019, um, the German companies based in India, um, how they perceive technical regulations. And almost a third of the companies. Uh, see that technical regulations, so mandatory standards, um, are an issue to doing business. Of those 32% uh, of companies who said that, um, it's quite insightful to actually look at what the problems are. So 70% said actually the problem is that the compliance procedures are not clear. 36% say um, that when standards deviate from international standards, that is an issue to doing business. Sometimes uh, it also just relates to um, the flow of information. So 34% say they just like didn't have enough time to um, to do the transition of their production processes to the compliance procedures. And 20% said that they found it um, difficult to repeat testing and certification requirements of the products that they might have already tested for the German or European market. Next slide. So now I would like to have a closer look at how do technical regulations work in India. Um, 
because many of you will um, will follow probably like the regulatory development um, closely. Usually, technical regulations in India are brought out through quality control orders. These are um, either issued by regulatory bodies set up by the government, for example, uh, the Bureau of in uh, Energy Efficiency (BE), or by ministries like the Department for uh, Promotion of Internal Trade and Industry or DHI, as um, it was already indicated, uh, the area of machinery safety. Um, and different from the EU, and I think uh, Dinesh will point to that as well, in India, usually technical regulations specify specific standards uh, which are mandatory. Um, sometimes essential requirements are being used, but usually the route is through um, standards which are declared as mandatory. The legal basis for such quality control orders is the Bureau of Indian Standards Act, which um, stems from 2016, where they actually enable the government to issue uh, regulations for any articles, service, processes, or systems um, for several reasons. Um, can be health reasons, safety, environmental, but also to prevent deceptive practices um, or security. Um, and as I said, they then use essential requirements or standards. And with standards, it means Indian standards uh, usually. Conformity assessment um, to comply with these quality control orders um, is usually done through BIS certification, but there are also other routes. And on the right, you can see actually two, uh, the two major routes for BIS certification, which is probably that you're all familiar with, the top one, the ISI mark, the standard mark, and below the more recent edition, which is a simplification of the certification process um, with the standard mark for registration. Next slide. Now I would look at um, very practically at a quality control order. And here I have one example, which was issued in January 2020 um, in the area of steel. You will see that. Um, they usually follow a similar structure. So at the beginning um, is the legal basis as mentioned, which I, as I said, is the BAS Act 2016. Then crucially, as I said, the transition periods sometimes are um, perceived to be short. Um, the implementation date, in this case, it's um, 1st of August, 2020. And in the quality control order, it would also specify what kind of uh, conformity assessment needs to be followed. So in this case with steel, it's the standard mark um, by the Bureau of Indian Standards. Um, usually it um, says that products which are meant to be exported would be excluded. So if you produce in India, but you actually only want to use it as a production hub to supply to the Southeast Asian market, for example, then it's usually excluded. And then BAS would be the certification and enforcement um, authority. And underneath, that is actually the most important part then for the companies, which is the list of the Indian standards which need to be complied with. And sometimes they are indigenous standards and sometimes they're um, adoptions of international standards. Next slide. So now the question is, how do you find information on um, such quality control orders? Um, of course, you know the uh, website of the Bureau of Indian Standards. Um, sometimes uh, new quality control orders would be um, informed about there. The WTO um, lists the notifications that India notified to the WTO. But sometimes it's also easier and faster to get um, a sense of new draft regulations directly from um, the responsible ministries um, we just like put one key ministry there, which brings out a lot of quality control orders, which is the DPIIT. But of course, depending on the sector that you're involved in, it might be a different one. And you can also visit our uh, project website, uh, Global Project Quality Infrastructure, gpqi.org, to find out further information. Next slide. And this is already then um, where I want to share with you what is our role as GIZ um, in supporting you and um, Indian stakeholders um, in the dialogue on conformity assessment. Here you can see um, a group picture of the seventh annual meeting of the Indo-German Working Group on Quality Infrastructure, um, which took place on 16th and 17th January in 2020 in New Delhi. Next slide. 
I said it's the Indo-German Working Group on Quality Infrastructure, which is a government-to-government -government dialogue with um, close involvement of um, industry stakeholders, which works in all aspects of quality infrastructure. And there's always a lot of confusion about the term. We don't work on um, on bridges or airports, um, but we work on everything that's needed to ensure the quality expectations and regulatory requirements. So from standardization to technical regulation, conformity assessment, metrology and um, accreditation, up to market surveillance. Next slide. And the way the Inner German Working Group on Quality Infrastructure works is that it's a policy and expert dialogue, as I said, between the key stakeholders between India and Germany. On the Indian side, the partner country, uh, the partner ministry, excuse me, is the Indian Ministry for Consumer Affairs, which is also responsible for the Bureau of Indian Standards. On the German side, it's the German Ministry for Economic Affairs and Energy, which is the Indian Corporation partner. And besides uh, these two key political partners um, in the working group, they involved further ministries subordinate government institutions, but also the standards and accreditation bodies, and crucially, industry associations such as VDMA, but also single companies, and further technical and scientific institutions. And this working group every year meets to uh, decide on an annual work plan um, to, um, to define which areas to cooperate on. And we as GIZ um, were commissioned by the German ministry to support the implementation of this work plan. Next slide. Um, besides India, we work in um, several other countries. So we have teams on the ground in uh, Brazil, in China, in Mexico, and soon also in Indonesia. And it's coordinated from um, our headquarter, um, project headquarter in Germany. Um, this all takes place within the framework of the global project quality infrastructure of the German Federal Ministry for Economic Affairs, um, which aims to reduce technical barriers to trade, uh, increase the safety of industrial production sites, and increase consumer protection and product safety. Next slide. And we work on all topics that are of relevance to, to the industry. Uh, we follow a very demand-driven approach. So you as companies can propose, if you face any technical market access problems, specific topics to work on through the political dialogue. For that, we have an annual preparatory meeting uh, with the German stakeholders ahead of the working group, uh, which I can inform about. We, so we work on um, actually, yeah, all aspects of, of um, Indo-German trade, including machinery safety, medical devices, but also automotive, chemicals, and some cross-cutting um, topics like cybersecurity. Next slide. Um, I think I'm just gonna skip this because I'm running a bit of time. Next slide, please. Um, we support you in understanding the Indian system um, and to support the, the dialogue on quality infrastructure. So um, you might also find helpful to have a look at our publication from 2018, um, the overview of the India's quality infrastructure, which is um, an overview document on how standardization works in India, how technical regulation works, how conform conformity assessment and accreditation exactly works, um, as well as metrology and market surveillance. Um, the publication is available for free on our website at uh, www.gbqi.org. And you can also find the precise link be below. Next slide. As I said, in case you're facing um, technical, markets as technical market access challenges on the Indian market, and you are a German uh, company or association, um, we invite you to join our preparatory meeting um, by invitation of the German Federal Ministry for Economic Affairs, which will this year take place on 16th of November um, online. I would please ask you to write us an email at uh, qi-india at grz.de um, in case you're interested in participating and bringing in your cooperation topics. Next slide. As I said, you can find uh, our um, project website, um, also latest news on regulatory developments in India, information about planned activities, um, and also like um, 
some news about past activities. So please check it out and also subscribe to our newsletter in case you want to um, stay in touch with us. Next slide. Um, we also um, worked on further publications which are more um, more technical and more um, sector specific. Um, with the VDMA, um, we had one um, comparative study making safe machines a standard in India where we're comparing um, Indian regulations and European regulations and based on um, talks with the industry make recommendations on how to improve machinery safety in India. Um, similar studies we did in the automotive area and just this year we brought out um, a publication on cybersecurity aspects and regulatory aspects um, in this emerging field, especially when it comes to um, IoT devices. Next slide. So now I would like to invite you again to participate in the global project Quality Infrastructure. Um, in case you're facing technical market access, you can receive support from us. Um, to solve problems with Indian authorities. Um, it's important that we don't work on individual companies' um, issues, um, but only if it's kind of like a, um, a problem that affects several um, several companies. You can follow us to uh, keep, up, keep updated on regulatory trends and, um, of course, like get involved in our um, implementation activities. Here you can find the contact information again. Um, so please write us an email at qi-india at gz.de um, in case you're interested to participate in the dialogue. So I think, Retoy, that's it from my side. Um, looking forward to the further presentations and also your questions in the chat. Thank you. Thank you, Philip, for your excellent presentation. And also, um, uh, thank you for sharing the information about the working group because most of the participants will be eager to know and uh, since it is uh, now the program is going to be held the webinar will be holding on uh, 16th november you said Rejoy, you are not audible you need to come closer to uh, your laptop Ajmal, please. So we would like to introduce our next speaker who would talk about uh, the single market conformity assessment, market surveillance and self-certification in the European Union. He is Mr. Dinesh Chand Sharma. Uh, Mr. Dinesh Sharma is the director, director for uh, SCSCI, which is the seconded European standardization expert in India. He has 21 years of experience in ICT and IT fields both in India and abroad. Now the topic for the presentation uh, today will be on single market, conformity assessment, market surveillance, and self-certification in, in, in European Union. Over to you, Mr. Sharma. Thank you. Thank you, Rejoy. And uh, very good afternoon to everybody. Uh, with an assumption that I'm quite audible and clear. First of all, I would like to extend my sincere thanks for Rejoy and the team at BDMA to, for giving me this opportunity to be a part of it. And while hearing uh, Philip, I was thinking it is so interesting that Philip being an EU national or from uh, not from India, talked about India and me being an Indian working on this project, have an opportunity to share from EU uh, EU knowledge around this particular important topic. So it's with my pleasure. Uh, the next slide, please. Uh, in today's presentations, in the next 15 minutes allocated to me, uh, for the benefit of those who do not know about me or this project, so say I will briefly touch upon it. And then I'll talk about the single market, European single market, European Union single market, which is the genesis around. Uh, this topic of confirmatory assessment, market surveillance, self certification, they both are interlinked, they all are interlinked and does help in single market. So, this is what uh, will be the flow of my presentations. Then I'll conclude. And if time permits, I would like to talk about one of the schemes, which is again a confirmatory assessment scheme, but more on a global platform, 
uh, from an IEC related to electrical equipments, electrical uh, components and equipments. But if not, uh, then uh, this slide will be shared and it has those information. To begin with, uh, I represent European Standards Organizations in India uh, through this project, uh, which is basically uh, an acronym for Seconded European Standardization Expert in India. While it is a project, it is a one-man project with two assistants. Uh, in nutshell, I'm a local face of the European standardization communities uh, in India. Uh, uh, this is a project of five partners, uh, out of which three are standards organizations. One is SAN, uh, which is a counterpart of ISO uh, in, in, in EU. Then you have SANELAC, which is a counterpart of IEC. Uh, then you have ITSI, which basically focus on ICT or telecommunication standardization. Uh, then project partner is also European Commission through its DG Grow, and then IFTA, which is a European Free Trade Association. So all five of them together created this project. Uh, this project has been running for, I mean, this is the seventh year of this project, which I have been leading it for the last seven years. Uh, there are reasons why this project was established and why it continues to, to work in India. Uh, because India is a major trading partner with Europe. And uh, the role of standards is, is becoming more and more important and increased uh, to have or to gain market access. Uh, with this increase, uh, the role is also becoming evolving and, and complex in, in, in nature of regulatory and standardization landscape perspective, which means we must understand each other uh, uh, when we talk about regulations and standardization. And through this project, uh, uh, we share a lot of best practices, uh, ultimately uh, explore opportunities to work together. Don't reinvent the wheel. Standardization is a joint effort. Uh, we should work together and that's how I bridge both the sides from the standardization and regulation perspective. I work on many sectors. Uh, uh, to, to brief information communication technology is one of my priority sectors. And then you have these subtopics for as an example. Then I also look after the electrical equipment, including consumer electronics. Again, many subtopics. Then you have automotive, uh, uh, and then you have smart cities. These are my main priority topic. Other than that, I also look after, uh, you know, uh, market access related issues, railways, environmental, wherever I see or where we see an opportunity to work together with India. All the information, latest, uh, are available on, on this website, which is continuously updated. So do visit on the website to find more information or come back to me. I'll share the contact detail at the end of the slides. Next slide, please. Uh, to begin with, <coughs> single market. Next slide, please. Now, when you talk about EU single market, uh, with some numbers, we could say that uh, market for goods consists of 450 million consumers and 22.5 million SMEs small and medium sized enterprises. It's a huge market, it's a huge consumers. Uh, to connect them, uh, uh, the main goal of the European Commission is to ensure uh, there is a free movement of goods uh, within the market, within the single market, and to ensure that there are high safety standards for consumers, and as well, there is a protection for the environment. And that's why this becomes so important. Now, when it becomes so important, there are building blocks which ensures that how we will ensure that the environment is protected and there is a safety standards or safety is taken care of when we see it from a consumer point of view. So there are building blocks. Now building blocks are confirmatory assessment, market surveillance, and then to have this connections of different market surveillance in the member states, the system which is information and communication system on market surveillance to connect all these member states. And then you have accreditation of these confirmatory assessment bodies. That's another building block, important building block. Then you have notified authorities which ensure the accreditation, the compliance part of it. The last but not the least is the legal metrology. With those as a building block, as we are talking in this, this webinar uh, about the confirmatory assessment and webinar, I can see that they both are complementary to each other. They both are interlinked to each other. And these both the procedures help us ensuring the smooth functioning of the internal market or the single market. And that's the genesis on which all these uh, uh, billing blocks 
work or ensure that there is a free movement of uh, of goods with safety uh, as a key criteria next slide please now that's a single market now let me come to the confirmatory assessment part of it i cannot cover all the building blocks uh, with the paucity of the time but i will cover up confirmatory assessment and the market surveillance part of it first is confirmatory assessment i mean for those of you who do not know it's uh, it ensures that the product confirms or confirmatory of a product is assessed before it is placed on the market to take care of the safety part of it it also need to demonstrate because whenever we talk about safety health and environment always there is a legislation now when there is a legislations we have to ensure and we have to demonstrate that all legislative requirements have been met and that's where the confirmatory assessment helps uh, always it ensures or includes testing inspections and certifications whenever there is a confirmatory assessment these three will be there as part of that process procedure the procedure of for each product is specified in the applicable product legislation so whenever there is a legislation if there is a toys legislation it will be defined how it should be tested inspected certifications which harmonize standards which essential requirement it is so detailed that you know any manufacturers could self certify or could go to the third party so this ensures product legislation compliances how does it work in practice now once you have a product legislation which actually describes confirmatory assessment procedure for each of these product manufacturers may choose i mean now when you have a database of different confirmatory assessment bodies uh, manufacturers may choose in to comply with the legislative requirement which procedure to be used sometimes confirmatory assessment procedures have different types or different criteria defined depending on the product category so they can choose which type of confirmatory assessment procedure to be complied with now assessment is carried out by the manufacturer i mean as i said i will be talking about in my subsequent slide uh, self certifications or or sdocs uh, uh, declaration of conformity but only only in a case if the applicable legislations for a high risk product a confirmatory assessment is involved and the confirmatory assessment process is followed otherwise manufacturers can carry out this assessment assessment by by themselves only uh, there are a series of standards which is basically uh, iso iic 17000 series of standards which which basically help achieving these confirmatory assessment uh, in regard to the standards compliance in regard to the accreditation next slide please now when you talk about confirmatory assessment it is important to know a little bit more about the notified bodies now these notified bodies what they do the confirmatory assessment which is a service to manufacturers in an area of public interest which means a safety uh, uh, as a prime uh, target it becomes the responsibility of the eu country to notify confirmatory assessment body within their jurisdiction according to a principle which was laid down in a decision way back in 2008 uh, of course this has been uh, updated and i will be talking about in my next slides uh, later but notified bodies are free to offer their confirmatory assessment services to any economic operators whether it is inside the eu or outside the eu now this is one of the functions of notified body they also carry out these activities on the territory of other eu countries as well i mean there could be an import criteria or could be an export criteria so they could go beyond or outside the, the 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 eu countries as well they must employ necessary personnel with a sufficient knowledge because it's it's mostly technical that's why this notifications or decision specify that the personnel employed should have a sufficient knowledge and experience to carry out confirmatory assessment in accordance with the law in question insurance is also an important criteria which notified body should be insured because there are liabilities involved into it in case if if any liability uh, comes across uh, tomorrow or uh, due to this legislation they also must provide information to the notifying authority market surveillance authorities and other notified bodies as and when required or needed this is what the decision has specified that what notified body should and would be doing it uh, when we talk about confirmatory assessment procedures 
Now, as I said, the manufacturers are free to choose any notified body. They need not to go of that particular country where they are manufacturing. They could choose any notified body that has been legally designated or accredited to carry out the contaminatory assessment procedure. Next slide, please. Now, that was on the confirmatory assessment part. Uh, on a market surveillance part, with a brief uh, 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 information about this, this market surveillance as a topic, I will talk about certain information about the legislation. Market surveillance involves checking whether product meet the applicable safety requirements. So once testing is done, whether it is done by manufacturers or notified bodies, second part comes up to ensure that it is done in compliance with the legislation. It does take care of the safety of the consumer product. And that's where the market surveillance comes. And in case if they do not, it involves taking the necessary steps to ensure they are met or it could impose penalties, or it could blacklist that manufacturer, or it could take out that product from the market. That's what the major role market surveillance plays. Now, in each member state, in each country, there are market surveillance authorities, which are responsible for controlling product and for taking the appropriate measures. They also work very closely with the customs. Because customs is a port where ins and out happens, import or export or within the single market as well, to ensure that the consumers uh, is protected uh, from any uh, imported unsafe product. Then European Commission also finances because we need to link all these market surveillance, uh, we need to coordinate and connect these market surveillance authorities and that's where Commission finances to ensure that best practices are shared and services uh, surveillance is carried out in the single market. A monitoring market is not just crucial for protecting people from dangerous products, but it is also to ensure a label playing field. Now, when you have a harmonized standard, when you have a common legislations, and it is implemented based on harmonized standard, the market surveillance also helps monitoring and ensuring a label playing field for businesses. Next slide, please. Now, a couple of legislations. These are three important legislations in EU, uh, which basically uh, are around and associated with market surveillance activities. The first one is 765, 2008. The, that is a year and this is a number uh, regulation. Uh, it basically sets out clear obligations for EU countries to carry out market surveillance and to prohibit or restrict marketing of dangerous or non-compliant products. Provide market surveillance authorities with power to obtain all necessary documentation for manufacturers to ensure evolution of product confirmatory. It also includes clear obligations for EU countries to ensure cooperation at national and international level. Now, there is also a decision uh, which basically uh, on a common framework for marketing of product contains provision on market surveillance obligations of businesses traceability and safeguard mechanism these provisions are also being incorporated on a sector specific regulation because sector specific legislation is also there but these provisions are also incorporated into it then there is a directive also which is which we call it as a general product safety directive which also contains additional market surveillance provision, notably for non-harmonized consumer products. So this decision helps which are non, not harmonized. These are three important legislations. And one of the legislations, which is 765, 2008, uh, will be replaced next year, July, 2021, with the new legislations, uh, which I will be talking about in the next slide. Next slide, please. Now, there is a new regulation which was uh, which was published uh, in last year, end of 2019, uh, which was on market surveillance and compliance of the product. This was basically aimed at improving and modernizing the market surveillance because now we have the online sales also. So there was a strong need to update the market surveillance uh, of the regulation, and, and that's the main reason. Now, this also helps uh, in applying it to the 70 regulations. So this new regulations has been linked to the 17 regulations and directive that harmonizes at EU label on non-food product to product consumers' health and safety, and in the Indian environment as well. It will replace, as I said, the uh, 765-2008 uh, as from 16 July 2021. I mean, I think we all know Whenever there is a regulation, we always get a two years to three years time period uh, to replace the, the old legislation. And as I said, the major changes in this is uh, to address the online sales as well. Uh, apart from improved coordination, 
and preventing non-compliance of this work. Next slide, please. So this is what uh, was on confirmatory assessment and uh, market surveillance. Now, uh, quickly, I'll talk about one of the important directive, which was basically uh, started or introduced in 1985, which has become one of the best practice uh, in EU, which is still working and doing doing very good uh, uh, results or deliverables in terms of compliances. Uh, it was a new approach directive. Now, this new approach directive basically clearly defined a relationship between standardization and legislation. So earlier, basically, legislation was on one side and the standardization activity was on, on the other side. Uh, 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 this, this, this has been clearly uh, defined uh, uh, in this new approach uh, uh, directive, uh, apart from talking about technical harmonization and standards. Now, briefly, if you talk about new approach, it talks about essential requirements. And I think uh, Philip did, did touch upon this essential requirement. Uh, generally, what usually happens when you bring up a legislation and you talk about a standard, and you just ask the consumer or the business community to comply with a standard, and standard could have so many things extra, which is not needed to address the health and safety part of it. So this clearly says that the legislation should only talk about the essential requirement, not the entire standard should be linked. Apart from that, there is a defined process that mission will ask the standards organization to develop standards, technical standards and specifications, which will facilitate the compliance with these ERs. And these, these activities are normally funded if member states agree not to, not to work on it. Uh, then the standards part comes into it play. Uh, standards does remain voluntary. I mean, even if we say that there is a legislation, there is essential requirement to comply with essential requirements, standards are there, standards always remain voluntary. And there's no legal basis to apply them. Any producer who chooses not to follow a harmonized standard is obliged to prove that their product conforms to the ER. I mean, it could be their own process uh, manufacturing process of manufacturers own defined processes which they claim that it could comply to the ER. They can do that. They have to ensure and that's where the market surveillance will come and play a role. And, and businesses make use of harmonized standards. They benefit from a presumption of conformity. As I said, you need not have a notified authority. You need not have a mandatory uh, testing and certification. You could have a presumption of conformity, which means manufacturer could carry out these testing and certification. Uh, meanwhile, when European standards are correctly applied, consumers do benefit from safe and environmental friendly product and service. This is briefly about the new push directive. Next slide, please. <clears throat> now, self-certification. As I said, most products covered by the new approach directive can be self-certified by the manufacturer. And they do not require the intervention of a notified model. Most of them. So self-certified, what? Manufacturers must, must assess the conformity of the product to the applicable directive and to the standard if applicable. They can do it by themselves. They need not go for notified authority. They need not do an external third party testing and certification. They can do it by themselves if they have the setup, if they can uh, do this. They have to prepare a, a technical file, file for that, which could be Market surveillance authorities could verify that they have they are complying to this essential requirement, and they can do affix the CE marking as well uh, on these product. Now, while saying so, a certain high risk product may not be self certified, but those are also defined in the in the in the in the in the directive or in the legislation as well, and they must be subjected to an EC type of examination, which means confirmatory assessment part of it. This examination involves the inspection of a representative example by a notified body. This is what, uh, 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 next slide please, this is what I can cover if I conclude. Next slide please. If I conclude, confirmatory assessment in market surveillance are essential building block to a single market in EU. Assessment is normally carried out by the manufacturers only in a case if the applicable legislation requires it, a confirmatory assessment body is involved and confirmatory assessment process is followed. Manufacturers are free to choose any notified body that has been legally designated to carry out the confirmatory assessment procedure. New regulations, which is 1020 in 2019, will replace or repeal 
765-2008 from July 21, and it does take care of the online sales as well. Uh, relationship between standardizations and legislations are clearly uh, working well uh, with the help of new approach directive for technical harmonization standards. Uh, as for approach, new approach, EU adopt legislation that define only essential requirements related to health, safety, and environment. Most products covered by new approach directive can be self-certified by the manufacturers and do not require the intervention of a notified body. That's it. I can share. I think I've run out of the time. Uh, I will not cover my other slides uh, unless and until if, if organizer allow me to do it. I go back to, and these are my contact informations uh, for any, any more information. Thank you. I go back to Rejoy or Chamal, uh, and let me know if I have to cover a few more slides. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sharma. And um, sorry, uh, due to proximity of time, we would definitely share your uh, presentation after this program to the participants. Now, I would re request Mr. Jayesh Jani, who is the National Manager Safety Service for Zinc India. A short introduction of uh, Mr. Jani. Mr. Jani is working with Zinc for more than 10 years. He has created awareness about safety services and standards for machine safety. Let me tell you, uh, the participants, that he is a certified safety specialist. He offers services like risk management, assessment, machine safety inspection. He has completed inspection for more than 250 machines in various industries like automobiles, Ford, etc. Over to you, Mr. James Jani. Thank you very much. Uh, am I audible? Clear? Yes, sir. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, first, uh, I would like to uh, thank Mr. Dinesh Sharma uh, because he made uh, my presentation a little easy. He explained about conformity assessment and uh, market surveillance. Okay. This is uh, by and large uh, a big topic, but uh, let me take it a little forward towards the machine side. Okay, like uh, about safety services. Why uh, we are talking about market surveillance and conformity assessment? The idea is to provide a safe workplace for the people, quality product with safety and all. Why this is necessary? Every year there are millions of industrial accidents happens and thousands of lives are sacrificed or wasted due to this accident. And this accident doesn't only cause the lives, but there are some other consequences of an accident. Like, uh, next please. Like a loss of money in terms of uh, compensation to the victim, penalties, insurance, loss of images, because if there is an accident, some fatal accident, then it's a loss of image to the company and loss of qualified worker as well. So these are the consequences of accident. So how we can avoid this kind of situation in industries? What, what method we can use to make our workplace safe, to offer a safe workplace to our people? There are some services through which we can make our machine safe. We can provide a safe workplace to the people, like machine safeguarding evaluation and checks, initial and periodic inspection checks, and stop time measurement. These are the basic services that can offer to validate or to certify whether the machine is safe or not. And SIC is here to assist in this segment for our customer, for our machine builder, to educate them, to guide them how to make their machine safe. Next, please. A machine safeguarding evaluation is a new program introduced by SIC. It's uh, basically it's a risk assessment process and a commissioning check process. Because in today's automation era, the production line become very fast, totally automated. Our dependency on machine is very, very high. Okay, and frequent changes of product based on the market requirement. So this type of uh, this kind of new demand or new market requirement of changing of product and changing of cycles and everything, it is very challenging to ensure safety. Okay. With this machine safeguarding evaluation tool, 
from sick we can support the overall current status of your machine and help to determine the protective measure is sufficient or we need to add something more to make machine safe because safety and productivity are hand in hand we cannot compromise or we cannot sacrifice production with the cost of safety and vice versa so both safety and productivity has to be in hand in hand our machine should be safe enough and productivity should be also as per the machine capacity what are the component involved in risk assessment like identification of hazard because in every machines there are certain hazard involved and that will be there because let's say robot machine or fresh machine okay there are certain hazard of heating crushing something like that right so we need to identify those hazarded area and we need to estimate the risk and once we estimate the risk we need to do a corrective measure or protective measure to eliminate the risk or at least bring those risk level up to an acceptable level another part is we can also estimate the performance level because every machine if you see the machine from coming from european market okay, they describe the performance level of that machine so we need to check whether this machine is uh, qualified for the performance level or not if not then we have to do a certain changes or certain modification or some corrective actions to reach to the required performance level and once we carry out all this assessment and check process it thorough audit report will be submitted to the customer which is valid for any uh, inspection or any audit purpose and we also recommend to improve the existing protective measure which is already in place on the machine next please so another very important aspect of is initial okay another very uh, important aspect is uh, inspection whether it is initial inspection or periodic inspection uh, i'm sure you must be knowing in a uh, european market it is mandatory to carry out initial inspection of the machine before putting that machine first time into the use to identify whether everything is as per the machinery directly or not if you carried out the risk assessment as per the eniso 12100 okay and you fix a sticker of conformity assessment c marking and all okay but before putting into the production it is always recommended to carry out the initial inspection right because the safety of the machinery is not only the responsibility of the machine manufacturer it is also a joint responsibility of end user as well because if i am a machine manufacturer i follow all the machinery directives and i supply a safe machine to end customer then it is a duty of end customer to maintain those safety maintain those protective measures taken care by machine manufacturer so in both the cases machine manufacturer as well as end user if they have any issues regarding understanding of the machinery directives or safety norms or safety standard sick can help to provide the service to check their machine for initial as well as periodic inspection now initial inspection is as i explained is a uh, services or checking for the machine before putting into the production and periodic inspection is generally as per the european standards every machine need to be revalidated or re-inspected every year particularly the fresh machines and other power driven machines like robot and other once in a two or three years it is compulsory in the european market so similarly uh, if we go with the periodic inspection so by the time of first initial inspection if we make some changes or some modification and if we change some dynamic of the machine it is always necessary to carry out a periodic inspection of the machines so benefit of this uh, inspection is we can identify the, any potential hazard which is unknown to us so before something goes wrong to the operator or the person who is working on that machine we can identify those potential risk and we can eliminate before it harm to the person next please there is another aspect of uh, safety distance generally if you see like fresh machine for example we are using some protective device like light curtain or something like that right? so there is a standard method or scientific method to install our safety product on machines it is not like that okay we can fix anywhere where we choose 
there is a scientific logically and theoretical explanation behind that like if you can see on screen there is a yellow box called s is equal to k multiplied by t plus c this is a standard calculation to determine the exact safety distance where you can install your safety product from the immediate hazardous point now here you can see these are the variables k t and c now k is the approach speed so we have no idea which approach speed we need to consider while calculating the safety distance because there are five people everybody will be approaching to the dangerous machine with a different speed so european directive has defined and fixed uh, approach speed let's say 1.6 meter is the walking speed and two meter is for the hand speed so let's say if you have a press machine you will operate this press with your hands so two meter per second is the hand speed you need to consider correct c is the resolution of your safety product which you are using on your machine okay now these two parameters two variables are more or less fixed you can find uh, on a uh, directives as well the only variable thing is t overall response time of your machine which includes the response time of your safety product the output of safety product goes to relay or contactor from there it goes to plc and from plc is go to motor now if you open the manual of all these product you will find the response time and you can put a mathematically calculation and you will get a total t but after two years four year or five year t due to wear and tear the response time of the machine may not be the same which explain in your manual so if there is a little change in a total response time of let's say half a second or one second which create a huge difference in your overall response time s or uh, overall uh, safe distance s for example if my required safety distance is 500 mm from the immediate hazard for example okay and due to miscalculation if i come to a safety distance of 400 mm now think about the consequences what will happen i have already eaten 100 mm margin now my body part will reach to the dangerous moment my machine will stop on my hand or my finger so this is absolutely wrong all your efforts like risk assessment initial inspection blah 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 everything will go into the pain because we already eaten the 100 millimeter margin each and every product needs some certain reaction time to react so that is why 500 millimeter is stated that before i reach to the dangerous movement all the energy associated with the machine will be isolated and person will be safeguarding now this t is very important to get exact uh, safety distance and by taking a reference from the manual sometimes it misleads us so what we can offer next please we are using this machine okay and the good part or the beauty of this machine is we are not going to disturb uh, your control system, machines control system or machines dynamic nothing it will be connected externally the good part is with uh, this machine we can get the real time total stop uh, time of the entire machine which includes the protective device relays contactors motors plc and all so based on this machine we can get the exact time and with the exact time now we have this approach speed is a constant either 1600 millimeter or two uh, meter uh, depend upon the application and c is also a constant like which kind of light curtain or safety device we are using so only variable part t if i can get this t total overall stopping time perfect then definitely i will get a exact safety distance which is uh, sufficient to safeguard the person so by using this thing, uh, we are getting a perfect result about at what safety distance my safety product has to be installed. Now, when we can use this uh, stop time measuring during the manufacturing process or finally before delivering to the customer and as usual annually, because we don't have idea about the dynamics of the machine due to wear and tear, the machine response or reaction time may increase or decrease, we have no idea. So it is always recommended to carry out this safety distance calculation annually or if you make some changes on your machine it is recommended to carry out uh, safety distance or stop time measurement on your machine next please 
So if we follow all this process, like risk assessment and inspections, then stop time measurement and everything, the final layout or final uh, the behavior of machine will be like this. This is the ideal safety solution where you can see this hazardous, two hazardous movements are there. One is robot and one is turntable. Both are very dangerous to hit the person. They can kill the person. But with these measures, like physical barriers as well as optoelectronic uh, protective devices with proper safety distance, exact safety distance and all, this particular automotive solution is now ideal safe solution for the operators. Next please. So I think I'm done with my part. The bottom line is that uh, we all have to try, we all have to support the industries to make the machine safe, to provide a safe working environment for the people, to ensure highest productivity with highest safety. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Tamsu Jani, uh, for the interesting presentation on safety, uh, for uh, safety of machines. Uh, we have our next speaker, Mr. Uh, Herman Wagner. He's from VDMA Frankfurt. Uh, he heads the Technical Environmental Affairs and Sustainability Machinery Safety Division in VDMA. Uh, yeah, and he has uh, done graduation in uh, Mechanical Engineering and has a total work experience of 17 years. So he has joined VDMA in 2014 and uh, he's uh, my counterpart in VDMA. So over to you, Mr. Herman. Hello. Uh, hello from, from Frankfurt. <laughs> um, first slide. Uh, OK. Um, uh, first, I would uh, give you some definitions. Uh, because uh, when we talk about norms, we uh, often have uh, two different type of documents to talk about. The first one is uh, legislation and legislation always is a mandatory uh, uh, norm um, and you have always to follow these uh, uh, documentation. And we have a second one and this is standardization uh, which is usually voluntary and uh, uh, mainly driven by um, companies or the, the, the economic sectors. Um, these uh, standards and the technical standards uh, describe in a, our understanding the state of the art. This is a way how a good machine or a good product uh, may be uh, designed. Because uh, this uh, the definition of state of the art is a common, commonly approved and accepted solution for uh, technical technical uh, problems or tasks, um, and these uh, common uh, understandings are written in these ISO or IEC standards, and these standards are uh, um, uh, divided into a Type A standard. Uh, type A standards always are very commonly and uh, say describe uh, um, as the overview for for a technical standard and. For example, for machinery safety, uh, it is uh, ISO 12100, and uh, this describes a, a, a safe machine in, in a, a very, very, uh, in not, not a very detailed manner. For a more detailed uh, type, there are uh, uh, type B standards. And uh, for uh, specific machines, we have, for example, type C standards. And these type C standards, they describe um, the, the risks of uh, uh, these uh, uh, machines and uh, what uh, is expected to do to avoid these risks. The type C standards usually do not describe a typical uh, uh, method to avoid the risk uh, because uh, these standards say always uh, give the manufacturer the freedom to decide how to reach this uh, safety and uh, this is for example one of the most uh, important uh, 
topics in this uh, situation because uh, for a safe machine there are a lot of uh, solutions and, and none of these possible solutions shall be locked out by uh, uh, describing a too specific way how to uh, solve a problem. Um, next slide, please. Uh, in Europe, uh, thanks to Mr. Sharma, he described uh, the European system very well. Um, we have, uh, in general, two, two main uh, uh, laws uh, or uh, legislative uh, uh, papers. Uh, one, they are called directives, for example, machinery directive. Um, they are, uh, they, these documents have to implement it into national law. Um, for, of, of each member, company, uh, member country, uh, but the uh, uh, typical requirements of uh, such a directive, uh, they must not be changed by the member countries. They also, uh, usually that's only described uh, what may happen if uh, uh, the requirements of the directive may not be obeyed uh, adequately. And uh, there are a second one, they are regulations, and these regulations say, uh, do not have to be implemented into national laws, they are directly effective. And um, this uh, legislative framework in Europe is uh, uh, very common. It, it's not very detailed. Uh, the details are uh, usually described in uh, technical standards or technical norms. And uh, if uh, these technical standards for Europe, uh, uh, you can recognize them with an EN uh, normally. <clears throat> if they are uh, adequate to the, to the uh, safety requirements uh, of, for example, machinery directive, then they will be published in the official journal of the EU as a harmonized standard. And uh, the benefit of such a harmonized standard is if you uh, apply an harmonized standard and uh, uh, um, implement it into your product uh, one by one uh, and re uh, achieve the required uh, safety standard, then you can uh, um, uh, uh, um, then you can say that your product is. Uh, in accordance with the uh, uh, legislative requirements. Uh, for Germany, for example, this machine directive is uh, implemented in the product safety law called uh, in Germany Produktsicherheitsgesetz. Next slide, please. Um, for understanding well, <laughs> um, uh, with uh, what uh, organizations we are talking uh, at VDMA for um developing a new technical standard not a law a technical standard my colleagues from uh, the norman ausschuss and vdma they, they are um, engaged only in, in writing uh, technical standards they talk to all these organizations you see on the slide um, for example with the european commission especially with uh, dg rose uh, with Orgelim, uh, with uh, ISO, the International Standardization Organization, with CEN, um, of course with the National uh, Standardization Organization, DEAN, uh, but also uh, with uh, uh, the authorities of the uh, country, uh, of the, uh, countries in Germany, and also of course with VEMAS uh, and uh, BMWI. Uh, uh, VEMAS is uh, um, uh, authority for uh, work safety and health, and BMWI is for economics. Next slide, please. Um, to drill a little bit deeper, uh, what means for conformity assessment for machines, um, uh, products with a CE marking. Uh, they have to obey all the European directives and regulations. And this is uh, the main task a manufacturer has to perform. He has to identify all the regulations on, and, and uh, directives that may apply to his products and have to obey them. 
Uh, this is, for example, for the machine. It's not only the machinery directive, it may also be a pressure vessel directive for uh, electromagnetic capability um, or a radio equipment directive. It's a question of the different uh, uh, components that are implemented into the machine. Um, uh, Mr. Sharm already, uh, already uh, explained that uh, according to machinery directive, most products uh, can be uh, uh, declared uh, as uh, conform to the European regulation by the manufacturer himself. Uh, that is true and that is right. It's only a very small number of machines that uh, need a, a third party to um, uh, uh, check the documentation of the manufacturer. Uh, but uh, what is very important, uh, it is always the responsibility of the manufacturer to perform this conformity assessment for the machine. And the third party is, uh, um, uh, uh, they, they check the documentation of the manufacturer. Uh, but the full legal responsibility for the machine uh, is kept with the manufacturer of the machine, not with the third party. Uh, uh, organization in this situation. Um, next slide, please. Okay. Um, now uh, uh, a manufacturer, what does he do to, to uh, fix, for example, a CE marking as the last step of this uh, slide? Um, uh, it is important, for example, the machine directive is a, is a very good example for this because it is, uh, in, in, in uh, my opinion, the most detailed <laughs> legislative framework for uh, product safety. Um, but uh, it's also for the number of uh, products that are covered by the machine directive. Um, because the, we have in the machine directive an Annex 1, and in this Annex, it is uh, all the possible risks and uh, dangerous situations that may occur in combination with the machine are described. Uh, some of them are not apl applicable to all machines, but many of the points are applicable to all machines. And um, this is uh, 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 the help of many, the uh, legislative, uh, uh, the legislator gives to the manufacturer what he expects from a manufacturer to uh, obey and what he has to keep in mind if he want to, uh, the manufacturer wants to put a machine or a product onto the market. Um, and uh, all those also risky situations. And um, also in this uh, uh, machine, machine directive is in Annex 7A. And this, this annex, it is very detailed, uh, described what the manufacturer has to do on paperwork to prove that his product is uh, in line with the legislative uh, requirements. Um, for example, there has to be uh, uh, elaborated in documentation uh, how health and safety requirements are applicable to the machines and how they are met. Also, there has to be, uh, 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 there must be performed a risk assessment. And uh, this risk assessment is an, uh, a vital component of the um, documentation for the assessment of the machine. Um, the ne one, 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 the next point is uh, that the manufacturer has to implement a a quality assurance system. It must this this uh, uh, assurance system must not be certified by a third party. It, is, it must only show that uh, it is, that the manufacturer is able to produce uh, every single machine uh, according to the requirements of uh, the first one or the documentation or the, or the design from the design office. Um, also, has, there has to be created uh, this uh, operation instructions uh, for a safe operating of the machinery. And, um, uh, in Annex 4, this is uh, one of the annexes that is un unfortunately very often emphasized, but this Annex 4 is uh, not so important as it seems, because in this Annex 4, there is a 
closed number of machines uh, which must uh, have uh, where, where for for which the manufacturer has to involve a third party uh, but this number of machines is uh, decreasing and uh, the requirements for uh, declaring a machine according uh, machine directive in line with the uh, technical requirements uh, these machines uh, uh, are decreasing um yes uh, the, the, the before the uh, the e-marking can be affixed on a machine it, uh, the manufacturer has to full, uh, uh, fill out uh, his uh, e declaration of conformity for the product and with filling out the declaration of conformity the manufacturer declares that he has obeyed all these requirements uh, written and uh, asked for in the legislative uh, framework. Um, next slide, please. Uh, here I've, uh, on, on this slide, I have uh, uh, put together some, some uh, uh, Arguments uh, pro and contra uh, certificate, third party certification or self declaration. Um, pro for third party certification is always a four eyes principle. Um, a second party has uh, checks the documentation and uh, may ask uh, good questions uh, to uh, uh, improve the safety of a, uh, a product. Um, well, no, unfortunately, this, this diversification of responsibility is uh, not not really a pro, but I uh, put it here on a pro because sometimes it is uh, uh, easy for a manufacturer to say it's not my responsibility. It's, uh, for example, the responsibility of the third party. Um, but uh, this is not uh, so 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 good example. Um, uh, and uh, another argument is. Uh, Often uh, the delegation of responsibility uh, to, or for example, a party one, uh, but this is also not a good idea because, uh, in my eyes and in, in the opinion of VDMA, uh, and it's not only the VDMA opinion, it's the uh, opinion of the uh, complete European uh, legislative uh, organizations, the responsibility for a product is always, always kept with the manufacturer and it uh, cannot be shifted to a notified body or a third party uh, organization helping to uh, perform a conformity assessment um, and uh, i think it is no, not so a good idea uh, always to put the uh, responsibility for a conformity assessment to a third party because a third party never knows every detail of a machine they do not uh, uh, uh stick so deep in the uh, design process uh, like the uh, guys that uh, design a machine um, another point is uh, um, usually a third party certification uh, it needs additional uh, time to perform this and this uh, is not all not even a good uh, or not not ever not always a good idea uh, if you have a, a product uh, and uh, that is, uh, let me say a little bit time uh, uh, time critical uh, because uh, you have, you, you, for example, you know there is a competitor, competitor who works on a, on a similar product and uh, if you have the, the, the always uh, to uh, perform such a third party then uh, third party uh, uh, assessment then this always takes time and uh, probably it makes more discussions and it helps for the, the uh, product safety and um, my experience is uh, not a, a third party certification is uh, only then useful if uh, the total safety of a product is uh, um, increased by this and this is uh, not not the situation i see in all um, 
And, and another problem of uh, third-party certifications often is the type certification. And uh, if you have, uh, uh, may put a quite similar product to the market, uh, then you have to uh, to do that uh, that uh, set uh, third-party conformity always again. Um, my argument for self-declaration is uh, it is usually very easy in the design process to perform all this paperwork that is required by the uh, legislative frameworks um, because it helps the manufacturer to uh, design a safe product, an inherent safe product. It is uh, safe by itself. Um, a self-declaration is uh, quite faster than a third-party declaration because if you have all the documentation and you have as a manufacturer only to check is it uh, is it uh, uh, applicable is it is it available the, the necessary documentation and so uh, all the calculations and all the design work is it done and uh, if then then you have uh, your own responsible person for this decision and uh, if uh, all that is uh, done then you can say okay the machine is safe and put it on the market. Uh, this also means less bureaucracy because uh, you have uh, a quite shorter track for a, a market conform product. Um, and this is uh, because the manufacturer knows, <laughs> I hope so, that he knows his product best um, uh, due to the the, the design process and, and uh, several tests in, in design process and the qualification process. Um, but to, to be honest, there are also uh, some points that uh, contradict to the self-declaration. This is uh, confidence in the accuracy of, uh, of the paperwork of the manufacturer. Uh, this is the problem. Yes, that's right. but. Uh, uh, usually, if you have a, a working market surveillance system, then uh, you can check all these pro uh, products uh, where you uh, expect or where you found uh, a lack in, uh, probably a lack in, in safety, and uh, then you can um, have a special eye on this product and uh, investigate only these products. And uh, a safe product or a product that isn't uh, 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 that has, has no negative effect so far, uh, you can you can uh, estimate that it is safe, and you don't have to uh, uh, concentrate on this. You you can concentrate on the products that are less safe. Um, and to be sure on this point, it is a high level of reliability for the manufacturer required. This is uh, the main problem, but I think uh, a uh, uh, good manufacturer and, uh, is uh, uh, reliable enough to put a safe product on the market if he knows or if it, if it is uh, quite clear that the complete responsibility of the safety of the machine and the, the, probably the harm uh, that is uh, in, uh, caused by a machine is uh, maybe blamed to the manufacturer, but this is not only the one. Uh, this is the only only situation. This is uh, um, till here. It's only the, the the point of view of a manufacturer, but there is a second one. And uh, next slide, please. That is the question of uh, using a machine, and this is this, uh, where the uh, the owner or the uh, uh, operator of the machine has to obey. Um, you see, it's a, a product lifetime from left side to the right side. Uh, you have uh, the, the the big. Uh, uh, big one is the product safety by design, and uh, if you go from the left to the right, then uh, in time you see the product safety by design decreases, and uh, the uh, blue one, uh, the uh, triangle, increases because this is the unsafety of the machinery. Uh, 
that uh, is in, in combination with the running of a machine. Then you probably reach a point where you say, okay, now it is necessary to uh, do something on the machine. For example, uh, you redesign it, or you uh, um, uh, uh, update the safety uh, equipment of the machinery. Then you may reach the same product safety by design right from the start on. And uh, then the time goes by, the uh, product design uh, is uh, decreasing and the unsafe un safety is increasing. This process by redesigning is uh, 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 mainly defined by the costs, by the original cost of the machine. And uh, if it is uh, usual uh, or useful to, to redesign uh, the safety requirement, uh, the safety uh, implementation, then you can do this two times, three times, four times. Sometimes it is not uh, known. Uh, at any time, it will be no more useful to do this. Then you finally reach a time where uh, the running of the machine is uh, really, really un unsafe and uh, combined with a high risk of an accident. And this is in uh, our opinion, the moment where you have to scrap your machine and uh, uh, replace it with a new one. Thank you. Next slide, please. That was it for my side. Any questions? Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Wegner. Thank you for the detailed presentation on giving an overview on the standardization uh, in Germany and across the globe and also giving us a good detailed information about conformity assessment procedure for safe machines. Now we'll quickly uh, take some questions, although we have received a lot of questions from the uh, participants, but due to the paucity of time, we will not be able to take all the questions, maybe one question each participant will take. Uh, first, maybe we'll ask uh, Mr. Philip. Uh, Mr. Philip, since the government of India is mandating for the, the BI certification for machinery safety now, mainly to curb imports uh, from China. So, uh, uh, and also the machinery safety is also one aspect. So would you, th would you think this would impact the German machinery import also and how is the GIZ or, and GPQI addressing this issue? That's a very good question, <laughs> very crucial. And um, the answer is not that straightforward. Um, so, we believe that um, machines need to be safe in the same way actually like around the world because people are safe and need to be protected. So we think uh, that um, there's a big benefit for India to follow international standards. And actually also in close collaboration with VDMA and uh, some German companies, what we did is we worked together with the Bureau of Indian Standards for the adoption of international standards for machinery safety. Um, now we believe that it's also important that the regulation kind of like builds on these international standards and uh, follows an approach of essential requirements um, so that um, the regulation doesn't need to be updated as frequently as the standards would have to be updated once the, um, the technology evolves. Um, so and um, also speaking about the benefits for India, besides protecting um, workers, is of course that if you follow international standards, you also have access to international markets. Um, and that's why it doesn't make sense to have uh, India-specific regulations for machinery safety. Um, and I think we're on a good way of, um, of um, having India on track um, to follow the international standards. Um, and let's see what, what the draft regulation is going to look like. Yeah, uh, thank you for the answer, Mr. Philip. Yeah, you uh, really uh, rightly said that there are international standards, India don't need to follow the, its own standards. But as per the update from the government that we have received, the, uh, the international standards or the foreign standards for these products would not be accepted anymore. And one has to test their products uh, in the Indian labs for the BIS certification. So I wanted to ask Mr. Sharma, uh, if, if this is the scenario, would the self-certification would be a viable alternative uh, in this situation? The answer is yes, but however, in India, uh, it's not as easy at, as it sounds. 
uh, in India, the awareness or the implementation of voluntary standard is not as broad as it is in EU. And the, the reason is the awareness, you know. So uh, that's the reason. Uh, I don't think so self-certification or SDOC would be a reality uh, in, in a short period of time. But in a long period of time, uh, when we continue working with the Indian uh, stakeholders, uh, they intend to, they want to go for that, you know, uh, and they're looking forward to do that. If you see uh, this compulsory registration order, this is one step. This is the first step which Indian government has taken to simplify the mandatory testing and certification, where they are asking, you know, the manufacturers to test it by themselves with the th uh, third party lab, take the report, upload the report, we will just issue a certification. So simplification is happening. Self-certification is a long way forward. India is looking forward to do that, but we have to go a long way. We have to have you know, a lot of awareness in Indian audience, the, the benefit of uh, standards, the voluntary standards implementations, quality product, make in India success only when it is based on the international standard, which, which Philip also highlighted. And that is what we are doing it right now. Philip is doing it through his GIZ product project. I'm doing it from my project. Uh, ministry is keenly looking forward to simplify the scheme, but long way to go. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sharma, for the good answer. We are also looking forward to it. Uh, our next question I would like to raise to Mr. Wagner. Uh, since Mr. Sharma also, also gave a good explanation about the self-declaration you also shared in your presentation. Uh, if self-declaration does not actually satisfy the market demand or regulatory requirements, that the manufacturer rely on the third third party certification. How reliable is this third party certification as compared to the self uh, declaration? Mr. Wagner, please. <laughs> this is uh, also not a uh, quite simple answer for this question because uh, this depends on the uh, uh, third party. Uh, how how much they are involved in the responsibility for the product? For example, in uh, in Europe, uh, as a uh, uh, manufacturer of a product is completely responsible for the uh, for, for for his own product, and uh, the third party is um, uh, let me say <laughs> to be honest only only a, a second pair of eyes that looks on the documentation and uh, um, they decide uh, on mo mostly on paperwork if uh, the design is uh, okay and safe sometimes in, in, in some uh, some some product groups there are really uh, uh, really really testings and and, and tests uh, but uh, for the most most products in the machine directives, this is not required. This is not necessary and uh, or, or not foreseen. And uh, therefore, I think it would be not so useful for a third-party certification um, because if you have a, let let me let me say a, a, a design lack in your machinery. Uh, uh, it is not quite sure that a third party can identify this and uh, makes a and, and drives the manufacturer to to redesign. I don't, I'm I'm not quite confident. Uh, I'm, I'm not not sure that this uh, third party certification will work on for a long run. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wagner. We will definitely share the presentations with all, with all the participants and they can directly get in touch with the participants also through email exchanges if any further information is required. One last question I would like to ask uh, Mr. Jani. Uh, since you talked about the product related to automation uh, for machinery safety, so uh, you understand that uh, we understand that the India is a cost competitive market. So since responsible manufacturers have to compete with the suppliers of low cost variants uh, and thereby this uh, workers uh, life comes at uh, risk or workers safety comes at risk. How to come uh, come out of this scenario? 
See, there are uh, certain parameters. It is always not necessary to use uh, expensive products to safeguard your machine. But of course, yes, it depends upon the type of machine. Let's say, like Mr. Wagner told, uh, type A, B, and C type of machines. Okay, in certain machines, if it is at most necessary to use some uh, expensive uh, safety products, then there is no other option. But see. Here, if you uh, want to make your machine safe, there are six uh, steps uh, and uh, there are three steps to rec uh, reduce the risk level. First and foremost, we need to try to address this uh, safety issue by safe designing. Okay, and if by safe designing of the machine, if our purpose is not sold, and if still there is a, a residual risk is there, then we have to use safety product, which is of course uh, add a cost to the machine uh, this thing okay and third is even after using a safety product still there is a risk available then we have to use some administrative measure this is the see as i told uh, safety and productivity both are hand in hand we cannot compromise productivity in lack of safety okay so if you want to safeguard your person okay then you have to invest a little bit on your safety once there is an accident happen, there is a huge money we have to spend in terms of compensation, in terms of uh, insurance and other stuff. So I think uh, safety cannot be weight with the money. Very rightly said, uh, Mr. Jani. Uh, so now I move forward to the con concluding uh, part of the session. So first of all, I would like to thank all our speakers, Mr. Wagner, uh, Mr. Grinstead, Mr. Jani, and Mr. Sharma for their informative presentations pertaining to the topic today, conformity assessment for a safe and competitive market. Friends, our mindset has and behaviors have already started to change. Clearly, the world will never be the same because there will be a long lasting effects of the pandemic. Safety in social life and industry would gain insignificance. And I hope the webinar today would have helped to give you insights into future of machine safety and conformity assessment for a safe and competitive market. I want to thank all of our uh, attendees today who have joined from our various industrial sectors. I would like to conclude with a quote uh, from Charles Schwab, the steel magnet born in 1862. He said, it is my sincere wish and hope that the day will come when the protecting arms of universal safety will spread over all industry and reach all the millions of workers who make industry possible. Stay well, friends, and above all, stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, very Thank much. you everyone. Thank you. Have a nice evening ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.